mankind's age-old treasure hunt, the search for health and vitality in the beneficent rays of the sun. Today, millions of people make regular pilgrimages to bathing beaches, mountain peaks, and other places especially favored by the sun, seeking its health-giving bounty. In ancient times, people reverenced the sun as the god of health, sending life to earth dwellers. In this bit of sculpture, over 3,300 years old, are a king and his family seated in the sun. To demonstrate the vital power of the sun's rays, the sculptor carved the word life at the ends of some of the beams. The Greeks and Romans prized the healing power of the sun. They built, as part of their houses, the solarium, where sun baths could be taken regularly. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, praised the beneficent effects of the sun in healing stubborn wounds. But neither he nor any of the ancients knew why the sun brought health, why it healed wounds. They knew only that their sun god sent life and health-giving rays, and that was good enough. But not good enough for the men of science who came afterward. Not good enough for the curious Sir Isaac Newton, who was sure that there was more to sunlight than meets the eye. So he trapped a sunbeam and passed it through a prism. And there were the colors of the rainbow, the component parts of white light. That was way back in 1666. Those ancient sun worshippers must have seen many rainbows, but they never associated this awe-inspiring display with a breakdown of sunlight. But the spectrum which Newton unfolded, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, were not all of the rays of sunlight. They were only the visible rays, that portion of sunlight which the human eye can see. In 1800, the great English astronomer Herschel discovered the long, invisible red rays, which transferred more heat than the visible red rays. And in the following year, the noted German physician, Ritter, discovered the shorter and more chemically powerful ultraviolet rays at the other end of the spectrum. Infrared, ultraviolet. We can't see them. How do we know they exist? Well, here, for instance, is a whistle. Not just an ordinary whistle, it's a dog whistle, which creates sound waves pitched too high to be heard by the human ear. But dogs hear tones of a higher frequency than human ears. Fido hears it, though we can't. Light, like sound, travels in waves. These waves, like ocean waves, can be measured. The length of a wave being the distance from the crest of one wave to the crest of the next wave. Ocean waves are the longest which we see in nature. These little ripples are also waves, but their wavelengths are much smaller than the giant ocean waves. But even these tiny waves are tremendous in size compared to the wavelengths of light, which are so small that an entirely different unit of measurement had to be developed. Let's begin with a measuring stick, a meter in length. One thousandth of a meter is a millimeter. One thousandth of a millimeter is a micron. One thousandth of a micron is a millimicron. But even the millimicron is not quite small enough to measure some of the newly discovered invisible rays. So the Swedish physicist, Angstrom, divided the millimicron by ten and got one ten billionth of a meter, or an Angstrom unit, the accepted unit of measurement of light. Visible light extends from 7,700 angstrom units for the visible red down to 3,900 for the visible violet. But the invisible infrared rays go up into the hundreds of thousands, while the invisible ultraviolet rays drop down to about 100 angstrom units. The existence of these rays had been known to science for more than 150 years, but it wasn't until 1877 that a sensational discovery was made by two English scientists. Their discovery was the start of the great modern development of ultraviolet therapy.
These men exposed a tube of microscopic organisms to the sun. They then wrapped a second tube containing organisms in black paper and placed it next to the first. After several hours of strong sunlight, they found that the covered tube was alive with microscopic organisms, while the exposed tube was free of them. This experiment, plus others, proved that it was the short ultraviolet rays and only the ultraviolet rays which killed bacteria. That is, they were bactericidal. But the ultraviolet rays of the sun could not be depended upon. For unfortunately, ultraviolet light, as offered by nature, is very changeable and unreliable. It varies in different parts of the world, different seasons of the year, and different times of the day. In addition, and even more important, most of the valuable rays are soaked up by the Earth's atmosphere. The long infrared heat rays get through the Earth's atmosphere easily. But only the few ultraviolet rays near the visible part of the spectrum reach the Earth's surface. And those few that do get through are further dissipated by the haze and smoke of modern industrial life. Even the glass in our homes and our modern clothes prevent us from getting any of the benefits of the sun's valuable ultraviolet rays. In 1893, Dr. Finson of Denmark who knew the bactericidal nature of ultraviolet rays, and also that sunlight was not dependable, looked elsewhere for a source of these curative rays. He developed a carbon arc lamp and a system of quartz lenses. He used quartz because it is one of the very few known substances which permits the transmission of all the ultraviolet rays. He concentrated strong ultraviolet rays on small sections of diseased skin and was able to clear up the horrible disfiguring lesions of lupus vulgaris, a tubercular infection of the skin. Another great advance in ultraviolet therapy came at the end of World War I. Lacking cod liver oil, Dr. Holchinsky, a Berlin physician, exposed children suffering from rickets to artificial ultraviolet rays. In a few months, these miserable little creatures with warped bones, flabby muscles, and inflated bellies were changed back into fun-loving children. After this discovery, ultraviolet therapy became standard treatment for rickets. Even at this late date, however, it was not yet known just why ultraviolet rays accomplished such remarkable results. But in 1924 came the discovery of the important clue which unveiled the mystery of the cure of rickets. Doctors Hess and Steenbach, working independently, found that certain foods, including milk, became anti-rachitic when irradiated. That means exposed to ultraviolet light. Now it was known that cod liver oil, irradiated skin, and irradiated foods all cured rickets. The question was, what did these three entirely different methods have in common? The answer came soon after. It was vitamin D, the vitamin which promotes the absorption of calcium and phosphorus so necessary for the building of strong bones and teeth. Vitamin D is produced in plant and animal life by exposure to certain ultraviolet rays. We know that green plant pigment, chlorophyll, is produced in plants only when they are exposed to sunlight. Keep a plant in the dark and the leaves lose that rich green color. They become pale and the plant slowly dies. Deny sunshine to human beings, and they also lose their healthy skin color. They become pale, listless, and fall easy prey to disease. What did sunlight do to keep plants and human beings healthy? It was found that ultraviolet rays act on a substance in the leaves of plants and in the skins of animals. This substance, known as sterol, is changed to vitamin D. The vitamin D is picked up by the capillaries in the lower layer of the skin. The ultraviolet rays also swell the capillaries so that the blood flows faster and more freely and carries the vitamin D throughout the body. Although these ultraviolet rays are absorbed only by the outer skin, they affect the metabolism of our bodies, the blood formation, 
the digestive system, the bone structure, and the whole nervous system. Further experimentation established the fact that the ultraviolet rays necessary to produce the reddening of the skin or erythema, kill bacteria, and cure rickets fall in that light wave band between 3100 and 2300 angstrom units. And this is the band of rays that became the goal for inventors of ultraviolet ray generators. While the carbon arc, the first of these generators, was useful for therapeutic purposes, it had too many drawbacks. To create the arc, the electrodes had to be made to touch, then pulled apart to form the proper gap the formation of sparks and ash, the high running expense due to its operation at very high temperature, and the nuisance of replacing burned out carbons pointed to the need for a better lamp. The early quartz mercury arc was an improvement over the carbon arc. Its value diminished, however, with usage, as the fused in metal electrodes deteriorated and formed a fine deposit on the inside of the quartz tube. It was this steadily increasing deposit which gradually reduced the ultraviolet ray output through the quartz until the electrodes eventually burned out entirely. 